Well, um, I've got the week off this week, and um, Trevor Holder is going to uh, bring the word to us today. And, and Trevor and Jenny are, um, what exactly do you call your position, Trevor? Uh, I should ask you this ahead of time. I guess we're technically campus directors. Campus directors. I, you know, after uh, talking with Trevor for a while the other day, I'd call him a missionary is really what he is. You're, you're really a missionary to the kids at UK. Yeah. And uh, he has to raise his own funding, uh, has to create his own program. Uh, he has to reach out to people. And uh, I, I know how hard that is. <laughs> you know, to try to make something out of nothing. There was there were no navigators at UK when you got here. Mm -hmm. And so he's uh, created this program with these kids. And um, I just wanted the week off. So I said, would you like to speak? And he said, yeah, I've got something to say. So uh, we welcome him and uh, pray God's anointing on him. And uh, I'm glad that you could do it. Hey, you want to adjust this? Sure. Yeah, I'll be wandering a little bit, so. Yeah, the camera only gets this spot right here. All right. You can't wander too much. So if I don't record it, go that way? Yeah. Okay. If you want to say something off the record, we'll be Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll still record. But you can okay. Else. All right. Uh, well, first off, I just wanted to give you a little bit of information about, um, about who Jenny and I are. We've been coming here to the gathering, I guess, for a couple months now. Um, so I feel like we're slowly getting to know different groups of people. But like Don said, we work with a group called uh, The Navigators. And how many people are familiar with The Navigators at all? One, two, okay, three. That's actually a pretty high percentage. Um, so we, uh, I grew up in a, a Christian uh, home for the most part and went to a church most of my life, went to a Christian high school, went to a Christian college, never heard of The Navigators until I was 20 five years old, 26 years old. So uh, it's a smaller group of people, but the NAVs have ministries, uh, navigator ministries in, in all different parts of the country, all over the world. Uh, they have different wings of their, of their organization. There's military ministry, overseas, inner city, collegiate. So obviously Jenny and I serve underneath the uh, collegiate department. So I'll just give you a real quick history of who we are and how we got to Lexington, and then I'll kind of launch into some stuff that, that I've been learning over the past couple of years. So... Um, Grew up in Ohio, near, near Dayton. Is anybody? Nobody's from Ohio. No? Okay. Uh, so we both grew up uh, near Dayton, Ohio. Uh, met in high school in freshman biology class. Um, yeah. Uh, one of my first memories. Anyway, I won't tell that story. Okay. Um, so um, so uh, we, uh, we actually started dating at the end of high school. Went to two separate colleges, uh, both up in... in uh, Ohio as well, got married, and then uh, towards the end of that time, I did a few years of church ministry, uh, youth ministry at a couple of different churches, and then um, we packed up all our stuff and moved to Middle Tennessee uh, in the middle of nowhere. I mean, literally, like the closest Walmart was 40 minutes away. Um, there's some great stories from that era. Um, we were down there for about two years, and then um, left. The, the, we worked at a Christian camp outside of, uh, outside of Nashville, and, uh, and then we left there came back home and, and thought we were going to be moving back into a church ministry setting again. Uh, and God made that really, really clear uh, that we were not going to be heading that direction. Uh, and uh, had coffee with a friend of a friend who worked with this weird group called the Navigators I'd never heard of. Uh, and then again, God really clearly directed us towards the Navigators. So um, with a five-week-old baby, was Patrick five weeks old? Okay, with a five-week-old baby, we flew out to Colorado Springs and started going through their training and then they said, here's X number of dollars you have to raise. And uh, pretty stressful summer, you know, for us to go out and fundraise. But uh, so now, pretty miraculously, uh, this is our seventh year on staff at the Navigators. And so we just have some crazy stories about how God has provided for us when we've needed it. Uh, it always comes that if you need it at midnight, it's at 11.59. Um, and that's never fun. It never, never gets less stressful. Um, but, uh, but we have some great stories about how God's taking care of us. So uh, we actually moved down here from Oxford, Ohio, which is where Miami University is. We served there uh, for, uh, before coming here for about three years. And, um, and yeah, when we came down here, zero, zero navigators at the University of Kentucky. Last time that they were here was 1984, uh, so almost my entire life. And, um, and actually, what's really interesting uh, and surprising is so we came to the gathering a few months ago, uh, and I came uh, to the men's meeting where we had chili. Uh, I think it was like the first official men's 
launch or something. And uh, and Steve Fisher was in line and shook my hand and small talk about why why we moved to Lexington a year and a half ago. Uh, and I said I work with this group called the Navigators. And Steve said, Steve said I'm a navigator. Uh, which is pretty rare, as I've already demonstrated. Um, but Steve actually came to Christ through the NAVs up in Michigan State through, uh, under the leadership of a guy named Hal Denny. And Hal Denny was the last Navigator staff here at UK. So Steve actually moved down here to help Hal back in the late 70s. Um, so uh, anyways, just some cool ways that God's connected us up, uh, even just since we've, we've moved down here. Uh, so if you have any questions more about what we do with the NAVs at campus, what that looks like, um, We'd love to talk more about that. We have a display board in the back which has some information. And if you want to uh, get any of our mailings, we send out a snail mail newsletter about every three or four months, um, just giving an update about what God's done that semester. So uh, if you want to get that, feel free to, to sign up on the on the sheet on the back table. So, all right, uh, that's all I have to say about us. Uh, so today I want to talk a little bit with you guys about uh, the idea of identity. Um, and what it means to have our identity in Christ. So this is sort of a, a catchphrase or a buzz term or buzzword that you hear a lot about, having your identity in Christ. And it sounds nice and clean and tidy, but uh, it's a huge, ambiguous idea. I don't, I don't know if anybody else has found this frustrating, but for me, um, it, seems, it seems like a very complex, confusing idea. What does this mean to have my identity in Christ? What does this look like? Uh, and so for those of us who are believers that at some point in our life we've said, I'm going to trust Jesus with my life. I believe he is who he says he is, and he did what, he, what it says he did. Uh, we go through this process of now we're trying to figure out, well, how do I give more and more of myself over to God? What does this look like? And so the, the fancy word for that is called sanctification. Uh, and so there's all sorts of debates about what does sanctification look like? What's the best way to do it? What's this process? Um, you know, how does it play out? And so, uh, so if I'm going to tell some of my story as we go through this this morning, and so hopefully you'll kind of see how it connects in. But my hope is that um, maybe for some of you guys this morning, you'll get a new idea in your head that changes the way that you think about change. Um, so being the new year, this is where a lot of times we get into that cultural pattern of making a New Year's resolution. And it's culturally pretty much a joke for a lot of people, right? You make a New Year's resolution, and a lot of people have broken them by now, uh, and then you do it again next year. So it's more of like a five-day resolution. Um, but there are some people that make drastic changes. You know, it's just a, it's a nice season for that to, for them to launch into. But for a lot of us, uh, it's something that we sort of make the goals knowing that we're going to fail, uh, and then we just do it again the next year. So hopefully this morning we're going to look at some new ideas about as we're trying to grow more in our relationship with God. What are we? What are, what's our mindset? Because the heart behind what we do is way more important to God than our actual actions. Now actions are important. But attitude and heart are way more important, uh, as we'll see as we look at some different things this morning. So this is something that I've been learning um, over the past, my whole lifetime, I guess, but over the past three or four years uh, specifically, just different things that I've been encountering, and hopefully I can tie some of that in this morning, which will make it make sense. But to start with, we're going to do a little exercise. So take out your bulletin uh, and find a space. I did it right here. But we're going to rapid fire through a bunch of different scriptures this morning. And I want you on the left-hand side, wherever you want to write this is fine, you're going to make three different columns. And one column, just put past, and the middle's present. And can anybody guess what the third one's going to be? Yes, all right. Um, shocking. So past, present, future. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to rapid fire go through uh, some different scriptures that all relate with our identity in Christ, or what it means to have our identity in Christ, or what our identity looks like because of what Jesus did. We're going to look at all of these different scriptures, and uh, since we're a pretty small small group here, we'll kind of do this like a game show, so you're going to have to be a little bold. But as I'm reading, we'll read these, I'll read them out loud, and as I'm reading, if you feel like something I just read fits into one of these categories, just yell out, past, present. Or future, and we can debate it as a group and tell you you're wrong or right, and then um, and then we'll we'll little, put a little tally mark underneath it. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead to the first first slide here. All right, Romans five one. So therefore, since we have been justified, thank you. That was not a plant either. Good. All right. So have been justified. It's past tense. So we put a little check mark hash mark underneath past. Okay. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, we have peace present. 
Okay, so we have past and present. And this is just in one verse, Romans 5.1. So let's go on to the next slide. This is verses 18 and 19. All right, consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. Yeah. Can you just maybe put one in every category? Okay. So put one in every category. So there's a will be made righteous uh, because of the sacrifice. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go on Colossians 1, 9-14. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of life. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. What was in there? All three again, right? Okay, so put all three down again. Past, present, future. This is a little less game showy, but it still works. Okay, uh, and we're going again. Colossians 3.14, I think is the next one, maybe? We got 4.14? It's all right. 3.14, and uh, I'll just read it. So pay no attention to the... It's all right. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. All right. <laughs> all right. Um, so here you go. Just listen. Uh, this is Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. All three. Okay. So we got all three again. All right. Um, next one. Philippians. All right. Philippians 3. So, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Future. Okay. Present, too. Our citizenship is in heaven. It's a current state. It's not will be. Okay, so there's present as well. All right. We're almost done with this exercise. Uh, Ephesians. All right. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgression. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the uncomparable riches of his grace expressed in kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Past. Okay? So he made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead. And he raised us up, and he seated us. It's all past tense. So it's there. There's quite a few different past references. All right. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the, uh, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Okay? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. Okay. So present and then past as well. The old has gone, it has come, so it's past and present. Right? We'd all agree it's not future. Okay. All right, so we're going to put past and present. All right, two more. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Thoughts? <laughs> mumble, mumble. What? Yeah. So I think you have past, present, and we can maybe even argue future. Because he says I live. Live would be present. So I would say past, present, and maybe future. We can maybe maybe find all three in there. Half a check. Yeah. Half a check for future. 
All right, and then the finale. This one's my favorite one. Hebrews 10, 14. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Past. Past and present. And again, maybe another half check for future. Okay, so this one is like, I watched Looper last night. Did anybody else see Looper? Okay. Or any other time travel sci-fi movies. Okay, this, this is a paradox just in one sentence, right? So because of by one sacrifice, he made perfect. So he's already completed the work. He's already perfected people that are currently being made perfect or holy. Seems like an illogical contradiction. Okay, so uh, so this leaves us with a few problems. If you, as you look over your sheet here, you're going to tell, we just looked at a few different verses that relate with the identity issue. And now you understand why this is so confusing. When people say, just put your identity in Christ. Well, when did that happen? Did it happen in the past? Or is it something that happened presently? Is that a daily thing? Or is this something that only happens in the future? Um, this this creates part of the confusion with the whole process. So um, we're left with a couple of different ideas here. Either Paul, because all of these verses were written by Paul, except for the Hebrews one. Um, either Paul had no concept of how to use proper tense when he was writing, uh, or he's really confused about time. He doesn't understand how time works. Or uh, he's trying to explain some massive idea that's a mystery that's hard to logically put our minds around uh, because he's written all of these different sections uh, and they seem to have the same thumbprint over and over again, that this is a past, present, and future event. So uh, as I was brainstorming and thinking through this, uh, I came across an interesting idea. So I need uh, two volunteers real quick. I'm not going to make you do anything weird. You just have to stand here and hold the end of a string. Anybody? All right, Tim, you can grab that end of the string and then somebody else to stand here. All right, Jeremy's here. Yeah. This is all planned, yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna have to stand on the step. You guys are really tall. Um. It's okay. It's okay. All right. So here's here's an interesting concept. We live uh, with a, a Newtonian understanding of the universe, which is simply to say, cause and effect. We view our world as cause and effect, which makes sense for us. I mean, that's how we stay sane is we think that as we go throughout our day, everything that happens is the result of something that happened before it. But the problem is, as we went through scriptures, Paul's describing things where sometimes it's cause and effect, but then he's also talking about effect and then cause. I mean, that's what Hebrews 10, 14 was saying, that he already made people perfect, but yet they're being made perfect. Like, this is backwards logic. And so... Part of this, whatever that crazy sci-fi time travel movie you've seen that leaves you scratching your head, this is going to be part of that experience. Like this is, this is not you're not going to walk out thinking like, oh, this is so clear. Uh, it's a one, two, three process because it, it isn't maybe a cause and effect experience. So let's pre- pretend that this string represents time, or at least how we understand time. And so we'll make Jeremy the beginning of time. So when time, which is just a construct, like co- time is something that God exists outside of. So this is something that God has made. It's the way we interpret experiences. And so God stands outside of time. So he can see the beginning of time and the end of time. He can view it from different angles. He can enter into time. And he can step apart outside of it. So uh, this is the beginning of time. All right. And then uh, down here, Tim obviously represents the end of time. All right. So, um, all right. So here, and we live, we live on this string and we're always heading this direction. So we can never go back this way, but we're always heading left or right, right? This is what we were taught since like second grade. We make timelines and we know how to view things moving this direction. All right, so we're going to look at a couple different ideas here. One is uh, we're going to put a clothespin on, see if it stays. Okay, so we're going to say that this is when Christ died, okay? So this is all real relative, and don't freak out. Like we're not getting close to the end. This isn't like the end of time. It's tomorrow. We made it past the Mayan calendar, so we're probably good. Um, all right, so if this is when Jesus died, right here, this is representing that, okay? And so we've read verses where it says that when Christ died, that you were made perfect, okay? And then we live somewhere, uh, let's say, in here-ish. So this is us today, 2013, okay? And then uh, we're going to say the end of time, way down here. Okay, end of time. All right. 
So again, this is all relative. I don't know how close we really are to this. But um, so here's the three different points on the graph. So most of the time, we view our lives this way. We think, okay, Jesus died in the past. So it's a past event, which now uh, moves forward. And I have, I live here. And so I uh, live in this tension between something that Jesus did in the past, and then in the end of time, we're, talk, we're told that we're, things are going to be perfected, that we're going to be made complete, that we'll be holy. Uh, and so I'm living here in the middle, and I'm in this process of journeying towards that end of the timeline. And so uh, what this can lead for us sometimes is we think, here's this past event, and that's present, our present experience is this, and then I need to work or turn myself or get better at becoming the thing at the end of the timeline. I'm affecting the outcome at the end of the timeline based upon what I do this way. But the problem with that is what we just read doesn't describe that at all. It describes something that looks more like this, which this is where the confusing part is. That this is the initial cause. Okay, so Jesus died. This is the cause, which then actually skips over everything we experience that moves towards an effect down here. So Jesus died, which made this an effect here. But now this is a new cause as well, which moves this way down the timeline to the new effect, which is here. I'll say it one more time, okay? Uh, so this is the cause, all right? This is the cause with the effects all the way at the end, which becomes a new cause, which works actually backwards towards us on the timeline, which becomes the new effect that we're experiencing. So what this means and what this looks like is this. Uh, oh, and by the way, let me pause real quick, just in case you think this is crazy string and clothespin, uh, like witchcraft. Um, the, uh, uh, if you get on Google right now and Google effects before calls, you'll find articles, even one as, most, uh, as recent as this past April. There are quantum physicists who are running experiments, and um, I mean, this is the best way I can illustrate what they did, but real-world experiments where they were measuring things, where they discovered that their measurement, so I think I need to explain this correctly. What they measured, uh, the results were determined by something that would be decided later, even if they measured it now. So the effect was measurable here, and then the decision was made here to determine what this would be. And so they're actually finding measurable ways in our universe that effect can actually flip the order with the cause. Which doesn't make, I mean, you don't have any categories for this. You would literally be an insane person if you lived your life working backwards. Because it doesn't make sense to us. But even scientists are saying there are things in our universe that operate in that principle that effect can actually flip places with cause. So, I talked about the first, the first timeline is this happened with, with Jesus. We're living here in the middle and we're trying to work our way towards that end. But it's an extremely different attitude and posture if, okay, so Jesus died. And at that moment, right then, we were seated instantly down here. It says we were seated, that we were made holy. Right then, we're down here. And so now, when I'm moving along this timeline, instead of trying to become something that I'm not, all I'm doing is just living into something that I already am, if that makes any sense. So instead of always living in this tension of, am I going to get there one day? Is it going to happen? Well, Paul seems to suggest that it's already done, that if you've made that decision that it's already settled, it was settled in the past, because it's already settled in the future, which means it's settled in the present. If that makes sense. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for being kind. All right. I feel like maybe this is just more confusing now for everybody. Um, okay. So we're going to move forward and look at um, maybe how this plays out in a practical sense. Because that's a great, like, well, that's a really cool idea. But how does that really affect how we live? Um, and so in my experience, there's two ways, and I think this will be up here on the screen, there's two ways to short-circuit genuine transformation in your life. And the first one, and we all know this, it's placing your identity in the wrong things. So um, a lot of our lives, we're dealing with that issue, right? About not giving our time, our heart, our attention, our efforts over to bad things, okay? The buzzword being sin, sinful things. So uh, we spend a lot of our time trying to wrestle with those sorts of decisions. And those are things worth um, being aware of and and having a plan, and figuring things out. But we spend a lot of time working through that. But the second one that I found is that if you place your identity in the right things, followed by good actions for the wrong reasons. And so in my experience, at least, this one is way more subtle 
and actually more cancerous of a, of a mistake to make over the long haul. Uh, and so I mentioned in the beginning that I went to a Christian high school, and I'm just going to share my story so, um, so I can give you great thumbs up, you know, idea why Christian school is a great idea, and I can share some stories about why it wasn't a great idea at different times. But um, basically what I learned growing up, and, and I can't blame a program or a system for this, I can really only blame my own heart and how I interpreted things, but as a 15-year-old, 16-year-old kid, um, I think I, at the time I thought I had great motivations for things, but I found myself in an environment where I was praised if I could out-Jesus people next to me. I don't know if that makes sense or not. If I, if I could memorize more scripture, if I could uh, sound better than my peers, or, um, and, and I did it in the, in the uh, obvious ways, like point number one, you know, the guys that went out and partied on the weekends, that gave their identity the bad things. Well, I didn't do that, so I was better than those guys. But then there's a whole other game to play, which is point number two, uh, which is um, can, I do even, can I do more good things than my peers? So not only am I avoiding the bad things, now it's, I'm going to read more Bible than that guy that's reading the Bible. So it becomes a sub-game of, of, uh, of competition, I guess, if that makes any sense. So um, for a lot of us, we do things without maybe taking the time to figure out what is our motivation for doing it. So uh, for some of us, we read our Bible because we feel guilty for not reading our Bible and maybe that's, maybe that's an okay thing initially to get us to read once, but for me it became a lifelong pattern of feeling a sense of either I'm qualified or I'm disqualified based upon my ability to do good things well. Not just avoid bad stuff, but how consistently um, I could do good things. And so maybe that's attending church or that's, uh, like I said, reading the Bible on your own or whatever it is. Um, it can slowly turn into this system of, you know what? I read the Bible almost every day this week. I feel pretty good about myself. I feel better. I feel better about my relationship with God this week because of my performance. And then, uh, and then you miss a week or a month or six months and feel, I feel pretty bad about myself. I feel bad about my relationship with God. And what I started realizing was uh, this whole system I had created had very little to do with the truth of Scripture around the, the sense of identity, what I, what I was drawing my identity from. And I realized that my identity was being placed in how well I could do those good things, how consistent I could be at, at performing. Um, and so here's a good way to kind of check, to, to do a little gut check, is to think through, um, like feelings are good things, but to, is to think through, are you similar to me in that regard, where is there an underlying bedrock sense of guilt when you don't perform well, or you don't believe that you perform well in some of these good things. So some of the things that would be good things to do is just to think through, do I walk around sometimes with a little bit of baggage around guilt, the sense of guilt based upon if I haven't read my Bible as frequently as I feel I should, or I haven't memorized enough scripture. Um, and so for a long time, this was the pattern I lived in, was um, needing to outperform my peers to do good things well, you know, better than that they could, um, and then, uh, and then when I'd have bad weeks of not reading as much as I should or whatever that invisible standard was, um, I think it's always, you always just want to be one step ahead of the guy next to you as the standard it seems to be, right? Because you, you know, okay, well, I'm reading the Bible three times a week. That guy reads it five. I'm losing. Now I feel bad. I have to up my game or whatever it is. I don't know. Maybe nobody else struggles with this, but this has been some of my, Experience, I think because there's a little bit of church culture that we all kind of live in and grow up in, uh, at least some of us have. So, um, okay, so uh, what I want to look at is that this isn't the first experience uh, where people have been confused about what it means to live out of this security of their identity in Christ. We aren't the first people, or I'm not the first person that struggled with this. And so, um, what I want to look at real quick is a chapter in a book called Galatians, which is Galatians 5. Um, so, uh, actually, we're going to go to this next slide real quick. Go one more. Yeah, so there's a question to ask. Are you putting your identity in Christ or in being a Christ follower? Which is, they're two totally different things. So, again, I'll just say it again. Are you putting your identity in Christ or in being a Christ follower? Now, following Christ is a, being a Christ follower is a good thing, but it's not a good place to put your identity. 
And I, hopefully that will kind of make more sense as we move along. All right, so Galatians. Um, so let me give a little background here before we start plunging in. But Galatians 5, um, Paul is writing this letter to the church in Galatia that, uh, that just a year prior he had started. So most scholars think it was a year, maybe a year and a half, when Paul wrote this letter back to the church. So the church started, this, this movement of God's Spirit came into town, all these people came on board, this new baby church begins. Paul sticks around for a while, gives instructions, and then leaves, go on to travel and plant more churches. And so a year or so later, he gets a report about how this church is doing. And basically what's happened is, um, after Paul left, some people that grew up with a religious heritage were part of that group in Galatia. Um, and so people that had grown up as Orthodox Jews lived around that area, and, uh, and they started realizing that they had a problem with this new early church. You have a bunch of young believers that are figuring out what it means to follow Jesus and what are they going to do with this. And uh, so Paul starts getting reports that people have, have kind of worked their way into leadership positions at the church and are telling people now, hey, it's great. It's great that, that Jesus died for you uh, and that uh, your sins are forgiven. But if you really love God well, then you're going to observe these other things as well. And so they kind of pulled in things that were very comfortable and familiar to them because it was some of their heritage. So they said, hey, we're going to take some of the, the things that were in the Old Testament law, the Old Covenant, and kind of pull those in. So, hey, it's good if you love Jesus, but, uh, but here's these other things. Now, if you really love God, here are the things you're going to do to show that you love God. And so we're not sure if they did, said that was a prerequisite for salvation. Hey, if you don't do these things, then you aren't saved. Or if it's just a a proof of salvation. Hey, if you are saved, you're, you're going to do these things. But there was this culture being created of uh, here are the rules to follow, and you need to do these rules in order to please God or to really be saved. And then Paul gets wind of it, and here's what he writes back. This whole letter is in response to this problem. But chapter 5 is sort of the core of it. And normally when I read Scripture, I don't know if you guys are like me, but I read everything with this neutral kind of monotone voice in my head for the most part. And I think I even read it when I read scripture out loud that way too. Um, but Paul is extremely upset writing this letter. Um, and so I'm really glad that Jeremy's here. Um, so I was thinking Jeremy or Scott. So Jeremy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to volunteer you um, to read. We're going to go to verses 1 through 13. Um, you don't have to like try to win the academy here. But, um, but you just, uh, I would just say don't read it in a monotone voice. Because I picture like... If you read this letter, if your parents wrote you this letter or a good friend, it would emotionally upset you hearing what Paul's about to say. So here you're going to get a glimpse of Paul's attitude towards these guys that came in and said, hey, here are the rules to follow if you want to be a good Jesus follower. And here's Paul's response. So this is verses 1 through 12, I guess. Go ahead. It is for prudent that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace, but by faith we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which you have. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is any value. Only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. You are running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of death. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whoever it may be. Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way to mass like Okay. So, Paul is not very happy, right? I mean, you can't use much more aggressive language with this group of people, okay? Not uh, in church. Yeah, yeah. Or at least uh, the boundaries would be expanded for us because of what would be in here. But, uh, yeah, he, uh, he uses some pretty strong uh, ideas. Uh, threats, maybe even um, so draw some interesting conclusions based upon the logic. But the thing that interests me the most is most of the time when I read Galatians 5, I read this out of Paul's addressing people that are struggling with sin. 
normally, right? So who cut in you? You're running a good race. I normally think, well, this is a sin issue uh, about doing bad things. No, like this whole book and this chapter is Paul talking about, hey, this is about the people that stepped in and said, here's how you need to be good. It's a totally different idea when you put it in context that Paul's saying, hey, be careful in the first verse, stand firm. Don't be burdened by a yoke of slavery again. He's not talking about sin. He's talking about the law. He's talking about a set of rules about what it means to perform well for God. And, and what's really interesting to me is Paul doesn't just say, hey, if you're going to perform some for Jesus, that's just a bad idea. Or uh, I don't know, like maybe if you do it with the right attitude, it would be okay. He even says, if you do this, if you allow yourself to take one step down this path, Christ is of no value to you. That's an extreme conclusion. Hey, if you're going to try to perform for God, then you don't understand what Jesus has done. Just forget about it. I mean, that's a huge step to take, right? So Paul is using extreme language with, with, uh, with this group in Galatia. Um, so the question that comes to my mind is why, and we're going to talk about this, this isn't rhetorical, why would the Galatians want to go back to the law? So some of them came out of the law, and some of them this is a new idea, but why, a year later, why is Paul having to write this letter? I mean, the good news a year prior was, hey, everything you've done is no longer counted against you. All those laws you couldn't keep, don't, you know, they don't count against you anymore. There's this freedom that's, that's taken over this church. So why a year later are they, is Paul writing this? Thoughts? Speculations? Yeah. Yeah. So it gives us something we can kind of measure how we enter out. We can we have a clear box to check. Okay. Other thoughts too. What was that? Yeah, this was causing a divide. Is is that what you're saying? Why? Oh yeah. 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 So what what other reasons would the Galatians want to move back towards law as well? Okay. Hierarchy, probably maybe some power play, right? What I was describing as a 15-year-old, I'm better than that guy because I can measure, right? So now I can measure. And it makes everybody the same. So we're all going to play the same game and grade ourselves on the same scale, right? So a lot of this, I mean, we like to think that 2,000 years later, we're really evolved and advanced and different, but we, I mean, this, we're the same sorts of people, right? We do these same sorts of things. So my question, the second question for me is, are we that different than the Galatians? Probably not. I mean, this was my experience as a high schooler and as a college student, um, is that I found ways that I wanted to measure, whether, even if I said, I don't want to measure, you know, Jesus is about freedom, Somewhere behind that, you know, even, well, that was a good statement about Jesus. That made me sound good, right? Um, so there's, there's this sense of wanting to prove my worth to my peers or to Jesus or to God. Hey, look, look, I'm a good investment. You made a good choice about choosing me, you know. Um, so we're not that different from the Galatians, that this is something we struggle with. So uh, we're going to take a real quick look here at a video clip by a guy named John Lynch. It's about, I think, four minutes long, five minutes long. So buckle up. Um, but... Uh, John wrote a book called True Face. So if anything I'm talking about this morning sounds interesting to you, True Face is a, is a great book to read. Uh, and uh, we'll listen to John here, but just to give a little warning, for some reason, whenever John gets excited about what he's talking about, he switches into like a kind of a bad Scottish accent. I don't know why. I think it's sort of a Braveheart thing. Uh, so he doesn't say grace, he says grace, okay? Um, but uh, so if you hear that, you're not crazy. He's actually doing that. But we're going to listen to this. But he says some stuff that's pretty powerful and concise. Um, so just pay attention. Feel free to jot down any lines that, that stick out to you. So go. No more inauthentic dead religion. Ask yourself these questions. Am I holding on to God or is he holding on to me? Because it's, if it's just you holding on to God, you're, you are sunk. Because you will bluff and fall back and you will drift away and you will go away. But he will never stop holding on to you. Are you trying to love God more? Or are you learning how to let God love you? Oh, you guys, if you get that one, oh, you got it. Are you learning how to let God love you? 
Stop trying to prove to God that you love him more. He goes, yeah, 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 whatever. We love him because he first loved us. Are you trying to please God or are you learning to trust God? See, pleasing God is, <laughs> what must I do to keep him pleased? Okay, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, without faith, pistos, trust, it's impossible to please him. So here you are over here trying so hard to please him and it's all about you and you never learn to trust and you never please him enough. But if over here, you're trusting God with you that he says, John, I wear a, you have a robe of righteousness on you on your worst day. I got you covered. I'm crazy about you. There's no condemnation. My father loves you, so also I love you. You've got a new nature. You're fused with me. And you say, you know, it doesn't feel like it today, but I'm going to choose to believe you. He says, oh, John, John, you're trusting me. You've never pleased me so much in your whole life, by the way. Are you trusting grace for salvation and then your flesh for sanctification? Or are you trusting grace for your sanctification? Remember what Paul said, 2 Timothy 2.1, My son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. It alone can make you stand. Are you trying to change? Or are you already changed? And now it's time to trust him. I, I love this thing. It's in our book, True Face. If you haven't bought True Face, just go buy it, please. I don't even care if you like it. Just buy it. I've got, I've got two kids in Christian college. Would you help me? I, I don't want to go to prison. Please. In that book is this quote. He says, if, I, if we brought a caterpillar to a biologist and asked him to describe its DNA, he would say this, I know it looks like a caterpillar to you, but scientifically in every testable DNA result, this is fully and completely a butterfly. Wow, God's wired into a creature looking nothing like a butterfly, a perfectly complete butterfly identity. And because the caterpillar is a butterfly in essence, it will one day display the attitude and the attributes and behavior of a butterfly. The caterpillar matures into what is already true about it. So it is with us, you guys. And in the meantime, yelling at the butterfly and telling him to be more like a butterfly will just hurt his little ears. God's given us the DNA of godliness, you guys. We're saints, we're righteous, and he knows our DNA. He says, I know who you are. He says, will you believe it? Because if you did, if you stood in it, do you know that it would actually mature you and you'd sin less? Are you a saved sinner or a saint who sometimes sins? Are you working to become righteous or are you actually wearing his robe of righteousness right now by faith? Are you living like God is over there and your sin is between you or are you convinced that he is over here with his arm around you? See, most of us have had this picture. It's, it's in true face. We talk a lot about it where once God was here, but now because of all the wrong things we've done since we've come to Christ, God's way over there, and it feels like he's going, oh, I'm so disgusted with him. I had so much hope for him. I really thought that he was going to be used by me, but he, you know, I don't want to talk to you. You disgust me. And I want to yell to him and say, I, please, this time I mean it now. I'm really serious. But it's like he's too far away and he can't hear me. What if because of the shed blood of Jesus that that was never true since the moment you become a Christian, that you're never separated from him? What if the shed blood was that powerful? From his talk. And again, interesting idea, the, the caterpillar DNA, that it simply grows into what's already true about it, just like this idea that we were looking at on the timeline at the beginning. So... To wrap this up, because I think I've gone way past my time limit, um, so we're canceling church for next week because we did double duty today. Um, all right, sorry. Um, so, um, so uh, it leaves this question. All right, this is great, right? So there's this anarchy freedom now. We can do whatever we want. No, not exactly, right? And so again, it becomes confusing. But Paul goes on to unpack it. Uh, so we're left with this question of. So how do we know if we're growing? Like, how do we know if we're, we're actually 
simply becoming more of what's already true about us. What does that look like? And so we could go real in-depth, look at a bunch of different scriptures, but it all is summed up by Jesus in Matthew 12, 33, which I think is up here. Yeah. So make a tree good, and its root will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its root will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. So you, uh, this seems like this big, deep, ambiguous question, and, and uh, people pose it to Jesus, and the way he boils it down, it says, um, it's like a tree. I mean, that's his answer. The God of the universe says, it's sort of like a tree. Um, and if uh, you look at it and the fruit looks good, then it's a good tree. And if, and if there's no fruit or it's dead, then it's a bad tree. And so uh, it's almost like he's saying, like, let's not overthink this here. Like, let's not go crazy with all sorts of measurements of, you know, I mean, it should be fairly obvious. And so uh, the idea of fruit, I mean, there's a lot of agricultural metaphors in Scripture, but the idea of fruit it isn't just about one decision that you made. It's not about one bad choice or about one good choice. Uh, the idea of fruit is simply what does the tree produce over the course of its season or of its lifetime. And so, um, so fruit, even though it's made in small decisions over time, it's much more about what is the overall production, I guess, if that's the right word, of what is your life look like. And so now it leaves us with the second question. So what is this fruit? And, and, and we're going to skip it because we're running out of time. But if we were to read the last half of Galatians 5, that's the same chapter where he goes on to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. So the first half, he's talking about how guys should go emasculate themselves because he's so angry. So he says, hey, no, we don't need the system. We don't need a performance scale. So what do we do instead? Well, at the end of that same chapter, he says that you're supposed to, and again, a confusing term, live by the Spirit. And that this is what the fruit is of the Spirit looks like. And so basically, look at the tree, uh, and if it looks more and more like Jesus over a period of time, then I think you can start assuming that it's a good tree, that, that it's becoming more and more like what it's already, what's already true about it. And if you look at it, and it has all the right lingo and all the right wording, but at the core it's rotten, and there, none of this fruit is produced over a lifetime, I think you can start assuming, I'm not sure what kind of tree that tree, it says it's a good tree. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going on with that tree. But the whole point becomes, um, how do we experience, what, what do we feel in our hearts when we're trying to grow in our life with Christ? Is it the sense, for me, for a long time, it was a sense of guilt and dread. And just as bad on the other side, it was a sense of qualification and, uh, and, and just feeling like I... I've done all the right things, and I feel really good this week. It was this roller coaster ride up and down. And so I felt like when I was a youth pastor, I had this dirty secret. I mean, I wish that I had a secret, like I killed a man when I was 12 or something like that. I felt like, the, I felt like one, that's a sweet story, and then two, people would be more likely to forgive that, right? Like, whoa, that guy killed a guy when he was 12, and now Jesus, you know, whatever. But I felt like my, my dirty secret was uh, I really struggle to sit in a room by myself and read the Bible quietly. Like, and in high school, I was taught like that. If you couldn't do that, that was a bad thing. And so my dirty secret was, I don't read the Bible enough. And if, and if they knew that, they would fire me as a youth pastor. I mean, I felt terrible about this. Like I said, I would rather have something that would fit in that first category of bad things you're not supposed to do. Because I feel like people would say, like, oh, yeah, that makes more sense. But I felt like there was this stigma, especially if you're a ministry professional, that uh, you need to have all the boxes checked. And this law that's not supposed to exist, but somehow still does, this cultural performance scale, and so for years, I felt like, if anybody knows this, I'm done. And so some weeks I felt really, really good about, you know, my performance. Other weeks I felt bad. And this was up and down, up and down. So um, as God would see fit, the irony is he brings us on staff with a group called the Navigators. And the Navigators started in the 1930s. Um, and uh, it's by a man who, named Dawson Trotman who decided to start it in the military. And so Dawes, his idea was, hey, uh, military guys do really well with systems. So we're going to create systems to help them grow. And so that's what, so the early NAVs, they kind of have this stigma of being like the Marines of Christians, right? And so here we are looking to come on staff with the Marines of Christians, you know, that have memorized 60 verses the first year on staff. And, you know, I mean, so now I'm working for the company in some sense that I feel like has imposed the very, you know, some of these things that I feel intimidated by. And so I remember I uh, came on staff or fundraising, um, they move us from Dayton over to Oxford, Ohio, and the, the regional trainer's there, a guy named Rich. And a buddy had told me, like, boy, like, you know, if you think it's been rough in the nav so far, wait till you get with Rich. I did not want to move. You can ask Jenny. I, I tried to not move to Oxford. Um, 
Because mainly because I didn't want to be with Rich. I was terrified that this man was going to pull back the curtain and see like, look at the the shoddy record of quiet time consistency. We're gonna you know we're gonna put you on a plan. You know, I mean you laugh, but these were real. I don't. Maybe this is just something that maybe I'm insane. But um, so we moved there, and uh, I had my first one-on-one meeting with Rich. Uh, and I decided to be that guy that's like, well, if we're getting fired, we're getting fired the first week. You know, I don't want to live with this tension. So we talked for a while, and then I decided to lay out all my terrible transgressions, right? Hey, Rich, you need to know this about me. Boy, this is some of my history. I kind of push back against these systems now. I really wrestle with it. I don't, you know, I'm not as consistent as I should be. I struggle with these things. I laid it all out for Rich. And Rich, a man who, not in an arrogant way, over time I learned, hasn't missed a quiet time in 32 years. Every day. I mean, uh... Yeah, this is the man I'm telling this to, right? And I think, like, I think of, I, I don't know if I did a quiet time this past week and a half. Um, and so uh, I lay it all out. Okay, Rich, you know, fire me. Or, and I thought I'd have a good attitude. He's probably going to put me on a plan, right? Like, we'll put you on a program. I'll call you every day. You know, have you fallen off the wagon? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, so I lay it all out, and Richard's response was, I don't care. Wait a minute, what do you mean you don't care? I just give you all these reasons about why I'm not good, I'm not doing this right. I don't care. He said, if I feel like you're growing and the fruit I see in your life looks like Jesus, then I'm not that concerned. And when you feel the freedom, you know, to you want to kind of grow in these areas because you feel like you're free to grow in them, then we'll do it then. But until then, I'm not worried about it. Genius move. I mean, this was um, my first experience with, with, with grace because someone gave it to me that I felt was in a position that could have, could have not given it to me. And so I felt, a, a, this, in, in this one moment, I felt the sense of, I'm allowed to be here. I'm allowed to be, I'm wanted here. Like, I can still be here. And so suddenly, uh, because of grace, I felt more of a freedom. Like, I can now, when I want to read, I can do it because I, I can. I don't have to anymore. So it was this freedom. And so again, a genius move. Because if he had given me a system, here's what would have happened. I would have done really well, maybe for a few weeks. Felt great about myself. Failed at some point. Bailed on the whole thing. <coughs> probably going angry, quit stat, I don't know. But grace was this liberation, set me free. So anyways, um, last slide and we're done, I promise. Is, um, so the last question is, are you free to be disciplined? So right around this time when I was growing in all this, uh, I heard uh, somebody speaking say this line about, hey, if all this freedom is great, because you know, part of me is like, yeah, down with the system, I can do what I want to do. And then he asked this question, well, are you free to be disciplined? I didn't like that question initially. I said, well, what do you mean? Are you free to be disciplined? He said, well, you know, if you think like, well, I'm like, I can't read, I can't read things consistently. I'm not that kind of person. His point was, well, then, then you're not really free, are you? If you think, well, there's just certain things I won't do or can't do, then maybe you aren't free in that aspect as well. So my encouragement to you this morning is to think through: Are you truly free as you pursue Christ? Are you truly free to uh, to grow more into what's already true about you? without all that guilt, emotional stigma, this weight of what it means to be in or out. And so I hope, uh, as we're you know, around the gathering more and more, that this is a community where people feel like they can be genuine and real about, hey, this is something I'm not good at, but I'm willing to grow in. I'm still learning. Or this is something I'm not good at, and I don't even want to grow in it right now. Like, this isn't something I want to do. And hopefully this is a community, I think, over time that, um, and that I've even experienced with Steve, you know, that will say, like, hey, that's okay you know what, we're more worried about what kind of tree you're becoming over the long haul. So uh, let me pray. I think Tom's going to come up and maybe we'll sing like one half of a verse to a song or something. But um, let me pray.